um, just uh, in terms of uh, background noise, um, I'll urge all the pa participants, um, uh, panelists and attendees, that if you're not speaking, please speak your, put your microphone off so that we avoid hearing background noise. Um, for the panelists, they'll keep their videos on uh, throughout the session. But for the attendees, again, please kindly just have your um, videos off as well. That would be very beneficial to the session to avoid uh, any sorts of disruptions. Um, during the question and answer session, we shall um, ask you then to put on your microphone when you're asking a question. So just some general housekeeping rules. If you do have a question during the question and answer session, please uh, raise your hand uh, in the Zoom application allows you to raise your hand to ask a question, please use that function. Um, and I think that's generally the housekeeping rules I'd like to, to raise today. So um, firstly, welcome all to um, April in AK is all about webinars. Uh, today's topic is working remotely, how to make it work for you. Um, so my thanks sincerely for everybody who's joining us today. Um, we know that these are unusual times. So while we're discussing this topic of how to make it work for you, we're also very cognizant that, um, you know, it's not that we're just working from home, but we are working from home under quarantine during a global pandemic. So it's important that we maintain perspective in terms of the conditions that we are also working in. Um, sec secondly, this conversation may, may be best directed for built environment professionals, but we'll also try to address some general questions and general challenges for anybody who's not in that industry in terms of um, uh, working at home. So just a little bit with that brief scene setting, I want to turn on my screen sharing just to everybody who's here to participate in a very short um, uh, Mentimeter exercise. So just give me a moment to share my screen with you. Okay, I trust that you can see my screen. I want to ask um, panelists and attendees um, kindly on your devices, whether it's your computer or your phone, just go to www.menti.com, www.menti.com. And please use the code 28 43 just what's on the screen, 28433. And let's just take a minute to answer um, that question. How does working from home make you feel? We have uh, four choices, challenged, alone, inspired, confused. Uh, just take a minute, um, menti.com, code is 28433. How does working from home make you feel? So please continue voting. I'll go, I'll introduce the panelists even as um, we go ahead and continue voting um, on the screen. Please continue voting throughout. I do trust you can still see my screen. Okay. Um, I will stop sharing the screen just for a minute, but continue voting. Again, it's menti.com, use the code 28433 we'll come back to the results of the vote. Okay, I'd like to take a moment now to introduce uh, our moderator, as well as our panelists. Uh, then I will hand it over to the moderator. Um, I'll start off with Etta, Etta Madete. Um, for those who are within AK Leadership, they may know Etta. Etta is actually part of the uh, chapter leadership. She is a part of the Architects Chapter Council. Besides that, she's an architectural designer at BuildX Studio, which was formerly Orchid Studio. Um, and she is also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. I know she looks very young, but she's a lecturer. <laughs> um, in, both in both capacities, she practices, she teaches, and she also does research on architectural design innovation um, that brings sustainable, economic, social, and environmental development to Kenya and beyond. Um, most recently, she was a panelist at the 18th International Conference on Non-Conventional Materials, and also the lead researcher for the East African section of the 2020 exhibition with Rem Koolhaas of OMA, um, which happened the, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York um, on countryside uh, architecture. Etta is a graduate of the University of Nairobi, and she is also an Aspen 2020 fellow. Uh, Etta Karibu Sana, just say hello to the people. Hi, everyone. Great to have okay. you here. Thank you very much, Etta. I'm also happy to start introducing the panelists. I'll start off with um, uh, Christian Benimana. 
uh, Christian is um, the principal and managing director at Mass Design Group of Kigali in Kigali, Rwanda. He's also the founder of the African Design uh, Center, which is really uh, set to be the Bauhaus of Africa with a mission to empower the leaders who will design a more equitable, just and sustainable world. He has taught at the Kigali Institute of Science and Technology, and he chairs the education boards of the Rwanda Institute of Architects and the East African Institute of Architects. His goal is to develop the talent and potential of the next generation of African designers with socially focused design principles. Um, so we welcome Christian, Christian Benimana, Karibu Sana. Thank you, Christian. I'd like to, to introduce the next panelist, Robin Emerson. Robin is the president of WIRE in Kenya, which is Women in Real Estate. She has, trans, she has transversed with ease between work setups across continents, cultures, private sector, large and small, and lives by the ease, light footprint, and connectivity provided through high technology use. She's also, she, she's also the co-author of Building in Kenya, a real estate developer's toolkit, uh, which was launched uh, late uh, 2019, in June 2019. Uh, she's got extensive years of experience in the real estate sector, 20 years of experience, uh, of experience, specializing in areas of public policy, advocacy, urban governance, business management, real estate and organizational development. Um, she has extensive work experience both in Kenya as well as in the United States. Um, she Karibu sana, Robin. Thank you so much, Robin. You, we, you um, maybe just um, increase your volume. We hear you one more time. Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. All right. Thank you, Robin. I'll move on to um, Hitesh, Hitesh Mehta. Hitesh is a landscape architect. He's an architect. He's an interior architect and environmental planner. He's a multi-international award-winning planner and designer with awards in landscape architecture, planning architecture, urban design, creative writing, and interior design. He has over 33 years of experience, having worked and consulted in 65 countries on six continents. He's probably one of the only design professionals to be a fellow on three different continents. He's a fellow with RIBA, Royal Institute of British Architects. He's a fellow with uh, AAK, Architectural Association of Kenya, and also a fellow with the American Society of Landscape Architects. He's um, recently been an examiner at JKUAT, an external examiner, and is an adjunct professor in three universities around the world. Again, broadly across the globe, USA, Madagascar, and Philippines. He's also an author of three books. We have many authors today on the platform. This is wonderful, including Authentic Ecologies by world-renowned publisher Harper Collins. He's been featured, interviewed, and mentioned in over 180 international magazines, newspapers, books, newsletters, and blogs. Hitesh is also a professional photographer and an ex-cricket captain of Kenya. Welcome, Hitesh. Thank you. Thank you, Mugaru. Okay, we'll move over to um, Lillian Cooper. Lillian Cooper is an architect, an artist, and a writer from the United States. Her professional experience includes working in both design and project management capacities across the U.S., as well as heading various volunteer efforts in India and the Honduras. She was awarded the American Institute of Architects Kansas City Chapter Emerging Professional of the Year Award in 2015. In 2017, Lillian transversed the globe while working full-time and remotely for her US-based architecture firm. Lillian is currently, currently balancing two very different worlds. One, a contract pos position as a project architect at HOK in Kansas City, Missouri. And two, a senior associate position with critical places, a non-profit to design and develop places critical to human well-being. She's a holistic wellness advocate and she's committed to serving marginalized communities and strives to position herself at the intersection of design, policy, and social justice. Welcome, Lillian. Thank you, so happy to be here. Thank you very much, Lillian. So um, I would like to go back just to the screen on um, what the results of our Mentimeter is. If I can just share it with the attendees. 
um, and the panelists. Um, so we are looking like people are feeling inspired with working at home. Um, a few people are feeling challenged and of course a few people are also feeling alone and confused. So we'd want to discuss all these various things and before I hand over to Ed Etta, I just want us to go to the next uh, poll which I'll ask that um, members um, submit your comments even as we, we go on with the main session. What is your major challenge working from home? If you can strive just to have a one word answer to that. What's your major focus, internet, whatever it is, which is your major challenge from working from home. Just post one word and we'll show the um, results towards the end of the session. So um, AAK members, non-members of AK, again, my sincere thanks from the association uh, for taking part um, on, in this, um, for taking part in this um, session. I will hand it over to Etta to take us through the rest of the moderated panel session and we'll open up to questions at the end of it. Asanteni and thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, again, welcome from AK, and I hope that you're all staying safe. My name is Etta, as I said, and I work from Ad Buildex Studio and I teach at the UON. But today I'm your moderator. So I'm gonna see how to drive this conversation so that we can all get the tips and tools that we need, as well as discuss a very important angle of well-being and health, which is important. Um, without further ado, I'm just gonna jump right into it and I'm gonna start with Christian. I think maybe I would like to start, start from the very managerial point of view. How has the transition been? Um, running a company with all, your, all the people that you work with working from home, how have you managed the transition? What, has, what is the biggest change that has happened? What is the greatest difficulty? And maybe what is your one tip on managing this transition as a, as a, a leader of a big company? Thank you, um, Eta. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Well, the transition has been, um, difficult to say the least of course um the the nature of our work uh, most of it uh, requires us to be together requires us to engage with our partners on a date day basis pretty much and not to mention not to forget mentioning that we have active construction sites that we all have to visit and and and, and inspect the work as we, we all um, are familiar with so it's been a uh, very challenging to do a, a complete reshuffle on, on those things. Um, um, but the biggest part, I guess, has to do with this internal uh, reshuffling. Uh, because for construction sites, obviously, they have to be closed because of the lockdown. Um, that means that there's a part of your labor force that is freed up for something else. And you have to quickly figure out how you know what's that something else is going to be uh, but also how that gets done effectively and efficiently uh, for design teams uh, i can say that maybe the change wasn't so drastic because uh, the global work together and collaborate with our partners remotely uh, but still we're doing it at a kind of like um, stretched form of um, limitation and constraints so we have to uh, kind of like do everything we're doing before but to kind of like a kind of like an extreme extent um so i, I guess one of the maybe things that i can call a, a big effect that this uh pandemic has brought to our practice at the moment is kind of like a moment of reflection that ha is beyond just what we do to cope, but also what we think our profession lacks to be able to be useful and respond the same way that certain other professions on the front lines have actually responded to it. And the number of things came out of that reflection. Um, we, in our early conversations, become very apparent to us that we need to be the voice of hope and reason for uh, clients and partners and, and workers on our sites because um, you know these times basically mean that 
investments and jobs are in serious jeopardy. And you know, beyond being the their architect who can help them through normal times and be able to um, carry their projects on forward, we be we also remain the voice of the reason that can kind of like help them understand how to navigate these circumstances that they have never dealt with. Um, nor did we experience them, but we had to figure out. So I guess in part of that reshuffling, uh, it's been interesting to see how um, that part of the team that was freed up to from those responsibilities can help push forward that effort. Okay. Thank you, Christian, for that. Just to ask even more, more specifically, what t tools are you using to collaborate with, with, with the people in your office right now that they're all working remotely? I can't go through the entire list because we'll be here for two days. Uh, there's a, a gazillion um, methods that are being used mostly to stay on communication. So any kind of... Um, communication platform you can imagine from email to zoom conferences to to straight phone conference uh, 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 calls that don't have any videos uh, to just pick up your phone and calling people and talk to them we've we've used all of them um, uh, we are also exploring some of ideas uh, of utilizing um, things we were doing before but unconventionally so one of the things that we're exploring is to utilize um 3d modeling softwares that uh in a way we could start building virtual mockups for one of our construction sites that we're utilizing as a guinea pig to see if this could work and of course it's time uh, uh, what do you call it it's time consuming, uh, of course. And um, uh, the internet is not always stable for us to be able to access a central model and be able to operate and manipulate the way that we would all love to. Uh, but hopefully at the end of these things, we're going to you know, can learn from that in how, when we return to normal and how we can utilize that for the better. But uh, Hitesh, um, and I'm just gonna say, you've been working remotely for a very long time now. I and mean, this was even before technology came into the scene. So what are some of the things you've learned along the way and what are the challenges that you've experienced? You're on mute. Yeah, there we go. So in, in my case, yeah, I guess it's a little very different than what Christian just mentioned. I used to work for a very large office, probably the largest landscape architecture office here in, in Florida. And then I decided to go on my own to work on my book, where I traveled to about 46 countries in six continents. And while during that time, I used to have about four or five projects going on. And this is the time when BlackBerry was just about three or four years old, came my virtual office. And the way I could communicate was with, uh, with a phone and uh, with uh, email. So I still remember I was in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, working in my hotel room on a site plan for a project in uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park, Uganda. My during those times this is 2008 uh, we I was already working virtually but with very simple tools and as uh, Christian has just mentioned that uh, in today's age with the tools that exist uh, it's actually so much easier but once you are used to working just as architects and landscape architects if you're used to working with a 6b pencil and, and stencils and everything done by hand everything else because challenges as a landscape architect right now i would say is is really the the fact that you know as, as designers we have to it's very important for us to immerse ourselves on the site i, I mean our office does any project in which we are not able to go to the site so we do not enter into any competitions 
where we are not paid to go actually on site and work. So that is probably one of the most, the, the biggest challenges is not to be able to go on site and be able to, to immerse and do a proper site analysis uh, before we begin. Uh, apart from that, everything else is, uh, you know, I mean, I, I work here from my, I mean, I'm actually uh, calling you here uh, from my home office but I've got an office which is four, uh, four minutes away. And uh, it's, um, th th there's, not been, there's not been a major change uh, for me because I've been working remotely as it is. Uh, I guess the only big problem I have is that I can't go to a cafe and have a latte and uh, just uh, have a downtime uh, part. But apart from that, it's, it's been actually a smooth transition. <laughs> That's great to hear. So from this experience that yours is not such a drastic transition, what are some of the things that you have, um, you found that work really well, like in communicating with others and collaborating? Yeah, we, we have been uh, working uh, on, on uh, you know, Zoom is a little bit more uh, recent, so to speak, but Skype has been a very good uh, tool uh, to, to documents to discuss straight away or uh, you know um, virtually in real time uh, to do documentation google docs has been very good uh, slack has been great to get teams together uh, but i would say that you know talking with other people in like christian's position that have got more than two or three staff um, microsoft teams uh, has been a very efficient tool uh, they have now taken Skype as the video component. And so that's a great way to connect with staff, to connect with clients. And, uh, you know, I, I think a mixture of all kinds of uh, tools, uh, Adobe, uh, Adobe uh, uh, has, been create, uh, has been good. And then with Microsoft Teams, you know, you can have all the Microsoft products that you can work with. I think those who have got uh, uh, Apple, uh, th th there's an iPad which has been uh, very successful and you can do sketch and draw and, uh, and, and share documents and things like that. So there's quite a few things going on. Uh, at the end of the thing, I'll be happy to share with you uh, some of the stuff here in the U.S. that, uh, that uh, our offices are using, um, you know, the different uh, tools and different practices to keep yourself sane as well. There's the whole mental and physical side, which I'm sure some of the other speakers are going to discuss as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I find myself in our practice sort of like holding up papers and trying to explain details. So I'm thinking that the design process is changing. So I can, I can switch over to Lillian to ask, because you've been working, you've done working remotely for some time too and you've been able to collaborate and sort of see how best to work in teams, both as an architectural as well as a project manager. So tell us more about the experience you've had and how the transition is and any tools that you might have and tips for this season. Yeah, so my initial experience working remotely was with a program called Remote Year that enables professionals to travel all over the world in a community um, while working remotely. So you bring the job and you get your employer on board and then this company basically coordinates your lodging and your travel and your workspace and your IT support. So that was my sort of jumping in. I will say that experience is very different than working from home. When I was on remote year, whether I was in Malaysia or Argentina or even in the US, I was given access to a co-working space and I had a constant community that traveled with me and sometimes you would live together and so it was still a very social environment um i'll go ahead and take the veil off and say that i was one of the people on the survey who said working at home makes me feel alone because i think a lot of us as designers are very social hands-on physical touch personal people and for me to not be able to physically engage with a community of people is really really difficult um, so when I was on remote year, I was, the nice thing about that is I was able to work with my company ahead of time to make sure that the work I was doing was really easy to do remote, right? 
So that's another reason that it was different. I was managing, designing, producing small projects on my own so that the collaboration part of it wasn't a big deal. Uh, I checked in with my team once a week, once a month, but I was communicating with my consultants directly and could kind of take care of it on my own. So that's the setup we had in place, which made it really simple as long as I had Wi-Fi. Now, as a design community, we're in a, in a place where it's everyone, right? And so we can't be that picky about what type of things we're working on and we have to learn how to collaborate. So as a contract employee, I have my nonprofit in India and then to balance that financially, I work as a contract employee. My last place was an eight person startup. Um, and so I had to provide all of my own software. And so I worked differently there. I kind of had, as you guys know, software is expensive a lot of times. And so I sort of had the bare minimum for whatever project I needed. And then now I work with HOK, which is a global enterprise, and they have all of the tools. So it's, it's been sort of a varied experience. The one thing I will say, um, similar to Hitesh, at the end of this, either in the chat or an email, I can provide you with an entire list of not only things like Microsoft Teams and Bluebeams that people are familiar with, but some other things that are in testing right now for doing like visioning sessions with your clients that typically is a very in-person, hands-on process. There are some things like um, Survey Legend, Survey Monkey, Google Sketchboard, some virtual whiteboards and survey tools that we've started using and we're kind of testing them too to see, to see what works. Um, but then I would say, as we're all learning together, I think there should be a general spirit of empathy across the profession and this desire to work with each other. And I would use whatever tool you have. I think, I think as designers and creative people, it's our, our job to find a solution. And if that is your pen on paper and you're holding it to the screen or you're taking a photo with your phone or you're scanning it or it's a screenshot that you rudiment, you know, you sketch on and you send in an email, that's okay. I think find the most efficient and effective way to get your idea across. And then if there are questions, you know, you can build on that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't let this be a time where you're embarrassed about lack of technology or lack of hand skills or lack of computer skills. I think I think everybody's going to approach it differently and we need to be accepting and celebratory of that. That's good. Thank you. I really like that direction of having empathy in terms of letting people find their own rhythm um, because sometimes you sort of want to get everyone to work on the same software in the same way, which can be a bit unproductive and ineffective in the long run. So sort of ex expressing empathy within the different individuals. So I guess even in that, it's talking a lot to do with the actual mental and health aspect of, of working from home. So I'm gonna just switch over to Robin and I'm just gonna ask her to speak about her experience. You've been working from home, you've been kind of paperless organizations for a very long time, you've been advocating for this remote working, homeschooling, um, this whole um, angle of using technology to leverage on productivity and efficiency. Um, so just speak a little bit about that. What are the challenges that you faced and what are the tips that you can give our listeners today? Yeah. Um, thanks, Etta. So um, I, I think one of the one of the things is is it's what is the context in which working from home sits, if you will. Um, the context here in Kenya is that we want to see each other. We want to physically see each other. If we're not seeing each other, we haven't had a real meeting. <laughs> it is not a real meeting. It was uh, a passing, it was when we see each other, then that will be the real meeting and then real business will get done. So that's been the context. So we have to now accept the reality that the normal that we used to have is no longer going to exist. We now are moving into a new normal, a new normal that is gonna pull us, force us to think about how we uh, operate 
um, and still produce, still are effective, still deliver what we are here to deliver on as colleagues in the built environment. And so part of me is saying hallelujah, <laughs> thank you, Corona. And so it's really what I like to say, it, even as Lillian was saying, in terms of the rudimentary nature of drawing and you yourself pick and drawing and showing with people and being um, having compassion with each other, there is magic in the mess. There's magic in the mess. There's magic for us to discover new ways that we're going to operate and that we're going to function. And so I'm, you know, so for me, we don't know how long this is going to take. But the question is, is how long are, is it possible for this new telework to stick? Do we know if the teleworking will stick? Do we know um, where that's going to be? And so, um, so Etta, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things in regards to that. There is, what, what is it going to take to stick? Um, and what are the things that we need to look at? One of them is what's the environment that's going to, um, you know, foster that to stick? The other thing is um, the opportunity, if you will, for us in the built environment to really um, pull forward the things that we espouse are important to us. And so the outline of that is around the SDGs. Um, so then there's a couple of things in regards to actually working from home, what that's going to call for. So I just wanted to point out, so the president said on, you know, on April 3rd, he appealed to, you know, I'm sorry, on March 16th, he told everybody go home and you're going to be working from home. But there are some realities that are going to be necessary for that. You know, internet connectivity. Um, what's the what's the reach and the span for that? What's the quality of networking that will allow for work to go on? Con, con, you know, the continuity of work. And then those uh, those are the people that are on our teams that are doing work that is not related to um, digital technology. What's the upscaling that's necessary um, that will have them continue to grow themselves in productivity and, and being able to produce that they don't feel like now they're just sidelined. And now all there, there is for them to do is just go home and tell those of us with a higher education um, continue to figure this out. So what's the upscaling that's necessary? Um, the Ministry of Health, you know, appealed to us and said offices and businesses, institutions, minimize the use of hard copies in our transactions and adopt the use of paperless mode, especially letters and other documents. That's, an, that's a directive from the Ministry of Health. And I, you know, I did that, I've been doing that for years. There's nothing necessarily today that says that we necessarily have to have paper, if you will. So how do we move all of our processes from our businesses into a digital stratosphere? So when we talk about our client engagement, what are the tools that we're using that are having us stay connected with our clients, that they can see the progress of our, our uh, the progress of our projects, that they can feel like they have someone that they're interacting with, that then they can hear them and that is responsive. So that you know, what are how are we attracting new clients? How do we move that into the digital stratosphere? How are we you know moving all of our files somewhere that's a safe location? Then the other thing is, is that we have to look at and we, we want to put back to the government to say, okay, I understand you're asking me to go home, but you have to know that I was already paying a rent somewhere. I already had office space somewhere, but now um, you, they dismiss the, um, the, um, the, see, the credit, if you will, to have a tax write-off for an office, a home office. They dismissed that two years ago. So now those of us that have businesses, you're, we are now burdened with still having to pay the rent for an office that's not being util, utilized, but now you are having space in your home that is, you don't have the, um, the tax. And, and in other places, I know Lillian and Hitesh know that in, in, on a tax regime, you're able to write that space off um, because it's been allocated for office use, that's, which is not there any longer. The other thing is to think about if, as we are moving our work at home, and, and Maguri spoke to it earlier, we weren't, we're no longer on just a temporarily home assignment. We are now, like I said, the new reality. So the quicker that we can accept that as a reality, we can start to adjust our whole relationship to our home, to the people in our homes, and, and move faster into that new reality. So part of that is I'm in my 
former son's bedroom, which is now being converted to a proper office, if you will. We just moved the, my chair that used to be at the office. We just moved that home. So I'm no longer sitting at dining room chairs and my back um, being messed up. But also when we think about it, you know, when men and women go, we leave our house, we go to our offices, we wear different hats in those offices. You might be the boss in that office. You might be the one that when people walk in, they're like, good to see you. But you're, we're no longer leaving that home space. And so you are still in the same home where you've had a wife relationship. You may have been doing some things in that mode. You brought into a space, but perhaps you're the woman and you're the boss at the office. And now the husband has to adjust. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, this is the same woman who used to so all of those dynamics we have to take into consideration they're yeah. now coming under the same home and people are going to have to um, figure out for themselves how are we going to maneuver this how are we going to engage in this new space we also know that in the sub-sahara that 45 percent of women don't have access to internet but now you know those power plays we're telling the people in our house I must have internet access. I must have a place designated in my conversation of how do we do uh, productivity effectively for all the members in our team. Yes. I'm trying to be helpful and, and empathize with everyone. I yeah. like the comment you mentioned on this magic in the mess. It's a yeah. messy situation, but as Christian says, we need to be the voice of reason and hope in this, in this built environment. Um, so I guess I can, I can also go over to Christian. I can go back to Christian there. You also work in a, in a company that is focused on social impact. Um, so I'm sure you're able to interact with this other aspect, where, which is, is, is difficult to, to not acknowledge. Um, and beyond that, just speak about the different sort of mental well-being aspects of people working from home and how to be effective regardless. Wow, I don't think I can speak to that as well as Robin just uh, laid out, but uh, I'll do my best. I think the, um, there's a couple of things maybe I want to touch on before I get to that question. And one of them, when you talk about social um, aspect of our work, um, I, can't, I couldn't help as Robin was speaking to, um, to think that actually like all of our work, not just masses work, um, has a very big kind of like social component attached to it. And Hitesh also mentioned that, you know, there's this kind of interaction with the site itself that needs to happen for their work to be effective. And they've created some measures around that. So um, I wouldn't say that our work is particularly social and we've taken uh, necessary different measures than anybody has taken because all we're trying to do is to reach out, to connect um, really and be able to uh, deal with real issues that are affecting our communities. I, I think that's what we're all trying to do. Mm -hmm. And the thing that this pandemic has revealed to us as architects and designers and practitioners in the built environment is that the moment they send us home as non-essential services mm -hmm. that has to, like whatever we have to do, we have to do it from home. We can't actually move, we can't do anything. That should be the first red flag. What did we miss for us not to be useful so that whatever we do, whether we do it outside of our homes or in the homes, we are being part of a response to such situation. I think that's the first interrogation I need to, to, we need to ask. And to come back to your question about the social part of it, I guess our efforts, when we are working from home, when we are trying to figure out what we do when we are working from home, I think the first thing that can help us to differentiate is uh, whether we're being productive or not is to see if what we're doing is helping respond to this situation or projecting forward, as Robin says, like, what are we going to do after this? What are we going to learn from this so that we can utilize it after it? What are we doing now? And what are you going to do after? I think kind of like having a, 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 a simple answer into to that question can start helping on what frames productivity for you. 
in that moment. Mm. And, and the next thing I think we need to figure out, you know, to question or to interrogate is um, how we are conditioned to work. I think also like Robin mentioned this, Hitesh mentioned this, and William Kopa also touched on it. There is a difference between working remotely and working from home. <clears throat> I, would, I would want to maybe put my understanding in those differences. We've all been in airports with other architects you can spot them from miles away because they're on a call talking to somebody on site, they're trying to figure something out. We all work remotely. We've all experienced that for some, in some form of the others. So the reality really is that what you're struggling with at the moment is not work, to work from work remotely, but is work remotely in extreme conditions where you actually can't even send that person but the reason you can't even send that person is because our work is deemed unnecessary in these conditions. So that speaks to the first question. And that's what we need, to, I think if we need, to, if we need to, to, to understand what those limitations are, if we answer the first question, then it will be easier for us to respond to the second question. Now that we're working in these situations where we can't work remotely per se, and then that leads on to a, a, a third condition now in which we need to figure out if we do have to work, then how do we question the form of communications that we've been accustomed to and break those norms and reinvent new ones? And again, Robin spoke very, um, uh, very well about this. Is what the, is this thing going to teach us about how, you know, how we break this culture we've been told that for you to be effective, you have to sleep in the studio for five days and not even take a shower and that's what the architectural life is. How do we break that cycle? How do we learn how to get messages across to people who do not necessarily understand our work and be able to translate what you're trying to do in simple means and ways? I think, uh, I don't remember who said this, um, it might be Lillian, blaming access to tools might be one thing, but it's not the majority of the things. Our inability to communicate effectively is probably the biggest hindrance to that. Because Hitesh mentioned that he was working from a BlackBerry um, 12 years ago, 22 years ago, <laughs> if, I, if I remember correctly. <laughs> he still has it. <laughs> Good line right? I think you challenged uh, exactly. you know, um, remote work working from home and then using that as a way to self-reflect on how do we communicate how do we express how are we actually productive and effective in the built environment and are our exactly essential exactly so exactly so direct yeah. yes so to end basically my my answer to your question is the way that our work uh has changed especially on that aspect of interacting with the you know, the, the, the societies and communities we work with is first of all from those three, three aspects. First, we figured that it would be very productive for us to invest efforts at, that, at this particular moment in time to understand how we can be helpful. How can we be part of the response, first of all? How do we make ourselves essential to what's going on? I think that's, that's very important. Then the second one is, um, now we're going to be essential or we're convincing people that we are essential and what we need to do is helpful and can be helpful. Um, how do we learn how to change what we do now so it can be helpful and be effective? But also how do we start informing our future practice on those lessons we learn now so that even after this COVID-19 is gone, we do not go back to those or uh, uh, old norms which made us um, obsolete in such uh, conditions. And then again, the third one is to revisit what our message to this community is. Um, our firm specifically pride ourselves to our commitment to develop architecture that promotes justice and equity. What does that mean in this in these instances. Um, I gave an example to some of my team members where I told them that in these difficult times, we should not be the first ones to run for the safety net. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because 
we have to remain the voice of hope and reason that helps our communities navigate through these difficult times, especially when the nature of the work we are working with them on is in serious jeopardy and is, is dealing with a lot of uncertainties. Yeah. And because of that, it's required of us to be extra courageous mm -hmm. to be able to do that work, to spend extra more efforts, ex spend extra more time trying to explain to people things that we want them to understand. Um, like you say, try to, to navigate and mitigate misunderstandings and, um, and, and all sorts of, uh, of backlash that might come from our efforts to try to do that. Yeah. And it's not an easy task. It's no, it's no single solution. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, we haven't figured it out yet, but the moment I do, I'll email everybody. Thank you so much for those comments. I took from them that we really need to use this as a point of reflection to invest in sort of like the direction and to revisit some of the questions we've been asking from our own companies, as well as question sort of like the fact that we're not an essential service, but we feel like in terms of social impact and justice that we can be and use this as an opportunity to inform practice going forward. I'm gonna ask the participants to start getting their questions ready and to, you know, figure out where the raise hand symbol is on the left, right hand side of the panel so that that session is smooth. But before we do that, I would like to sort of jump back in to, to ask Robin, just in terms of maybe two tips on mental well-being in this season, homeschooling, working, practicing, etc. Just two tips um, as we prepare for the question and answer se session. Um, I think the two tips I would give is one, um, it, it, you know, it sounds, this may sound obvious, but a lot of the things that are obvious are not, common sense is not common, I guess is what they say. Um, having a schedule, ha really having a schedule is, is critical because, you know, we might feel like, oh, all I'm doing is walking from my bed to the next place and you know I can come in and out and it's there anytime and whenever I want to do a project or get something done you will end up at the end of the day feeling like you can't see the difference between your time work time all the other distinctions and you'll be you'll have resentment You'll end up with resentment about the work. You'll end up with resentment about the people in your life because they all will seem like they're um, in, intruding on, on each other. So having a schedule. And um, you see, one of the things that it was just, I just want to add this, Etta, is that because we are working from home, we're not sitting in traffic for three hours a day in Nairobi. You're not sitting in traffic for three hours a day. So you may, so you wanna also, part of that is get into the reality of what your work hour and your work productivity has been. So you don't feel like, wow, I have all of this time. Let me go and also try to figure out the, the vaccine for, for, for Corona um, because I have all of this time on my hands. Get into the reality. You probably were doing a four to five hour output during, the, during a work day. Don't now try to figure out, I need to do 10 hours. You want to, you want to balance that and, and get a reality around um, your, your life and get some schedules and boundaries. Um, I think that's the, the main thing. And, so that, and also distinguishing space. So boundaries of time and, and space. Those are really great tips. And I think both as somebody who's working for somebody and as somebody who's managing other people, it's important to realize now that the boundaries of time are a little bit different. Um, so I think I'll ask also Lillian, maybe just one tip on wellness in this season, and then we'll segue into the question and answer session. But before Lillian answers, I want us to thank, I want to thank all the members who have attended today um, from the different regions, from Kenya, the whole East African regions. We have people from all over the world in this session today. At the moment, we're at around 160 participants. So thank you for coming. And I'd also like to thank um, our AAK fellow, F.G. Mungai, who's also with us today. So thank you for coming. Lillian? Yeah, I, I think my probably number one piece of advice is to do something active when you first wake up, <laughs> especially if you don't have that division of space like Robin was speaking to. I'm in a 400 square foot studio. My bed is literally right there. And it is easy to just roll from bed to computer. And I think 
if that's a walk around the block, if it's 20 minutes of yoga, if it's squats or push-ups or whatever it is that um, gets you alive and kind of gives you a division between your night and your morning, I think it's better than any cup of coffee you'll find. Um, the other thing I will say is I think Christian is right that we do have this task and this duty to be brave and courageous and to push the boundaries and to um, you know, utilize this situation to make ourselves necessary, but you first have to take care of yourself. And I've done enough work in India um, to have been in a place where I was, I was socially and physically isolated for three and a half months doing work over there, where even if I wasn't alone, I a lot of times felt alone. And I just realized really quickly that if I was empty, I could not pour out. I wanted so badly to serve people well, and I just, I couldn't because I wasn't tending to my mental and physical health. So give yourself so much grace, give yourself time to transition. This isn't gonna be an overnight solution and it's not going to be easy. I think start there and then when you, a month from now maybe or two weeks or six months, I don't know. <laughs> From now, when you get to a place where this starts to feel a little bit normal, then I think we can step into those, those bigger shoes and really have an impact. So take care of yourself and take care of your family. Don't ever feel guilty about doing that um, because it's only going to prepare you to be more successful with your work. All right, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, thank you panelists for the engaging conversations we've already had. I'm seeing about three questions in the Q&A section and I see Irene's hand up. So I'll start with the first question and then Irene, I'll get to you. So in the Q&A box, I can see the first anonymous attendee has, has asked, how do we mitigate the risk of lack of commitment from clients when physical interface is reduced? Maybe Hitesh, you can speak on that. How do we mitigate the lack and uh, the risk of lack of commitment from clients when physical interface is reduced? Um, I think the most important part, the situation we are in here, is uh, that it's really worthwhile to stay connected, not only with current clients, but with ex-clients, because the uh, net virtual networking development should continue. It's very crucial. Yeah. So one way to mitigate and, and to get those connections is, is in fact over communicate if you have to with clients, with consultants and with your staff, but especially with clients because in this uh, era we are living in and you know, being social animals, uh, you need to spend that extra effort to, to communicate and uh, uh, keep them informed. You come across interesting articles, share it with your clients. Uh, if they're related particularly to projects, even if they are not, but that continuous connection is, is crucial. Great, thank and you for if that. It's a, if, it's a, if I can I'll just add that that, that uh, risk is also there in face-to-face -face relationships. Yes. That, that risk is there in face-to-face -face relationships. So that's kind of part of reducing the myths about working from, from home or distance, if you will, because that's probably a myth. I won't be able to keep people connected. People are, lose commitment in face-to-face. -face. There's so many clients you can see every day and then they just don't do anything. So, you, so we just want to you know, notice what are myths. And, and he asked the question about the potential of somebody um, losing commitment. It hasn't happened yet, so don't go into a fear or fret about something that hasn't happened yet. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask Irene to ask her question, so just unmute and go ahead, Irene. Hello? Okay, I can see her question is typed here. She asks, how do we deal with salary during working from home period? And also, how do we manage, how do you manage staff working from home in terms of supervision? This is correlated to another question which asks, how do we deal with dwindling staff outputs? 
In my experience, the remote nature of working from home has made some employees lazy and inefficient. Maybe Christian, you can speak on that. It's a tough one. I, yes, it's a difficult one. I missed the first part of it. Do you mind repeating? How do you deal with staff salaries? How do you deal with work productivity and lazy staff? And then how do you deal with supervision of staff? Yeah, so that's uh, so the first one I think has to do with um, I think uh, not not just like architectural firms but businesses in general. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think our response to that is going to be specific to our industry, but all the businesses right now I think are going through the same form of um, economic measures that uh, are in line with. Uh, what the situation requires for us to respond to. So certain organizations are going to deal with it differently. Some organizations that have seen their um, uh, streams of incomes dry up uh, over one time, you know, over, overnight, have already stopped uh, or put their employees on suspension, which is not really a great thing to do. But at some point, you need to make these difficult decisions. So I don't think that's... Um, foreign to, to, to people running businesses. Or you can come up with creative uh, you know, ways of doing this. There's some companies in which uh, you know, the people making more in the top, top tire are taking cuts so they can you know, float uh, the entire population of the, of the organizations longer. So, I mean, I'm saying a lot of things, but I think the simple answer to this question is, it's going to vary from organization to organization, from operations to operations. And I guess you need to see what works for you. Um, what about uh, staff? So about the staff now. Um, we, I think the nature of our organizations uh, depends on, on, on you know, the productivity and income, and of course, like meeting our deliverables and, and be able to move on to the next project. Like that's, um, that's a fact. Um, so I guess the, the, the way as we are coping with it is moving uh, people on to billable work that we are um, we have at the moment. We lucky to have billable work we can move and, and migrate people onto. And I don't know what to advise people who don't have that billable income at the moment. I would be lying if I say I have a solution for that. Um, but I guess the the important thing when we are making some of these decisions in my opinion, would be to not make them purely from a commercial standpoint, because our staff are our most valuable assets for our companies and our work. And without them, I don't think we'll be able to do anything. So I guess if that relationship is soured at this particular moment, my hunch would be that it wasn't there in the first place or it wasn't built before. And I would rather question what has led to that situation at this particular moment where a simple conversation of the situation you're faced cannot be discussed and decisions are taken collectively in a way that, you know, uh, even if there are many things we don't like about the situation, but we are in agreement is the right thing to do. All right, thank you. And the, yes. la Sorry. the last question, I don't remember what it was, uh, but it was about productivity. How do you supervise I I believe there, all, there was, uh, there are, and there will always be two types of people, people who are micromanaged and people who are macromanaged. <laughs> and, and I guess the, the way of doing management is not going to change because we are in COVID-19, um, I, I assume. I think if we know our teams and we know how, who we can rely on to, you know, be diligent, be able to deliver to certain deliverables in certain times and, and meet their, their targets. I think we could, that reality remains the same, unless there are circumstances that has happened that we are not aware of, that might be a hindrance for them to perform to that level. And for those who needs to be micromanaged, I'm sure there's plenty of platforms that can still allow you to check in with them if it's calling them every 30 minutes to see where they are, or ask them to send you whatever you need to manage. Uh, whatever you need to produce so you can verify it before they you know go too far before they wander too far um, there are many many ways you can do that um, but still i think the to lilian's point like the most important thing what we need to prioritize right now 
is to check in with our teams on their well-being, on their restraining circumstances that happen with them being mm -hmm. confined to their homes that might not make them the same person they were when they were working in the office before mm -hmm. these things, this thing happened. And once we understand that, then we can make adjustments accordingly. Yes. I, uh, I just want to add here to this question about, you know, staff uh, concern about being lazy or inefficient. You know, something I, I'm in a webinar here a few days ago. And, and the advice here is that it's really important to start to have a routine. And it would be very good to begin the morning, and it was briefly mentioned, with a staff meeting, just like you would have at the office, to have goal setting, set up goals for the day. And then sometime during the day, maybe early afternoon, is to check back again. You know, it can only be, it doesn't have to be a more than a 10 minute uh, Zoom meeting, but get all the staff together and check how everybody are doing. And then especially if some of the staff are, you feel are not just, just generally inefficient, even in an office setting, make sure you check in with them. And one other final thing is being social animals, we need to replace this as we call it this water cooler or, or coffee station to chat away from just business. So you could even after your meeting have a five minute thing about just general thing, asking staff about their family, about their children. Uh, you can even talk about the TikTok queen <laughs> with her and all that other stuff is, uh, related to just stuff, have a little bit of laughter. And then that's the way of getting the team together and, and inspire, you know, inspiring them uh, even more. That's it. Can I add something? Oh, I know that we all have. Um, I just wanted to just say that, listen, we none of us have run a business in a pandemic. None of us have run a business in a pandemic. And so whatever business model you had, whatever operations manual you had before, that needs to be re completely redesigned. Whatever strategy you had, so you that are hosting uh, free webinars or retooling your business inside of this new era. You want to get, you know, it gets too out of hand. You, those tools are out there. You are going to have to retool yourself. You're now a coach. You're now a virtual um, manager all of those things. And so you're, even you, your tools that you had before March 13th are all gonna have to be changed, upskilled, transformed, upgraded. And so that you can pass that on to the team. You got, as the head of the team, and Alice, I know you asked about PVC gutters. How do you measure that? Alice is gonna take creativity. You're now gonna have to get creative with how you do that. You could empower me as your customer to go out there and figure out how to measure it. That sounds exciting. So Alice, it's gonna take creativity. It's gonna take nothing the way that we did business before March 13th. It's probably gonna carry forward. Um, um, I think, thank you for those comments. I think they're very, very valid. I mean, this is our, our I was saying yesterday that we are a face-to-face, eye contact, handshaking society. And now we just have to trust people from the from our screens and we have to transition the way we communicate and the way we communicate with each other. Um, so the sounds that the sounds is there obvious. From can I just one note? <laughs> um, oh. It's really obvious because we're all sitting here talking with our videos on, but I'm finding on most calls that I get on, people aren't turning on their videos, um, probably because they didn't do their hair that morning and maybe they're still in their pajamas, but I think this is as close to face-to-face -to -face as we have. And I'm finding that when we have, we have like staff coffees together and we have digital birthday lunches and we're doing mindfulness Thursdays and things like that to check in, the leadership always turns their video on. And I think if we can get better about doing that again in this world where this is the only tool we have, do that, use your hands, sit back far enough so that you can still engage as best you can. I think it's really important. Great tip and one that I actually do all the time, even in my pajamas. 
<laughs> one other one other thing that I was going to add on to that, if I'm if I'm allowed, is um, we also need to allow space for some other people to take um, the lead mm -hmm. and help bring innovation. <clears throat> Every single one of us has these people who are crazy, and will come up with a way of running a quiz on a conference call that you'll never think about because most of us are new to these technologies and some of these young team members have born, were born with these technologies. What some of the things we're doing in our office is to figure out ways of keeping the same social event we're doing, but doing it on, um, uh, on, on conference calls. And last week, um, our team members organized a very successful quiz night, um, put up a bunch of questions, figure out how the entire thing is going to be run. And people participated, they formed teams. Apparently Zoom allows you to create groups and different chats that allows people to, in the same team to converse. And, and, and so it, it's a crazy word out there. If myself, I don't fully understand it, but the result ends up really being Fantastic, people, because people get to see each other, they get to laugh together again, um, they, you know, they tease each other. It, it creates not exactly the same sense of, you know, meeting in the kitchen and, you know, when you're going to get your coffee and discuss, but it, it brings back that kind of like cohesion within the team that is not necessarily about work. And one of the things that I've also said that we need to change is to feel like every Zoom conference has to be scheduled and has to talk about work. Like no one put up that rule. So one of the things that we really need to be careful about is like, even this moment prioritizing the culture of the office as equal as the work yeah. is very important because one of the thing we do when we are with crisis is to Hi, Christine, we lost you. It matters most to you can happen. We did not touch on the point of the fact that we keep talking about people working from home and ignore the fact that some people have homes where it's impossible to work from. That is a reality we need to, to, to be faced with. And before we force people to be productive while working from home, understand things in their way that might prevent them from being productive while working from home and what we can do if at all as organizations to help them okay thank you i think i'm gonna i'm gonna segue into two final questions which i'm getting from all the um from the chats that i can see here one is to 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 talk about the students in the in the in the in the panel in the in the room right now the students are asking what is the future of this? What are the repercussions of this pandemic? And is this a new normal? What is the future of, what is the next generation of architects need to start thinking about? Maybe Christian and Hitesh, you can speak on that. Um, and they're also asking how, how can sort of remote working and working from home, how can it now be incorporated into the curriculum? And it's something to think about. The second avenue of questioning, which I'm seeing a couple of comments on, is to do with construction sites. I know you mentioned some of the construction sites are closed, but does anyone have any advice on trying to supervise construction sites that are still active in some of your regions? And how do you manage that? And how do you reach the builders? How do you ensure quality? Do you have any tips along that? Before you begin to answer those two questions, I want us to also um, to welcome another AAK fellow. His name is QS Kairu Bachia. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your presence here. Um, so the, this this Two last questions before we sort of begin to wind up. The first students and the future generation of architects from Kaduk there, I can see his question. And the second is on construction sites and managing and supervising remotely on live construction sites in this season. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll answer the question about, from the students. And also there's another one related to uh, experience people help out so um, having uh, seen all the other flus before 
um, stars and mares and all of that. This is, I mean, I look at all the classes half full. Uh, it's going to end. And there will be normality at some point, but it's going to be, of course, the new normality. Now, we have, I have been over the years, you can see when I, I'm, I'm an adjunct professor now at three different universities, one in Madagascar, one in Queens, and another one here in Florida. And now what's, what's been happening already is that the webinars, you know, a lot of the presentations are being done exactly like I'm doing. I've been doing uh, international conferences, uh, presenting uh, this way. In fact, the Microsoft Teams, uh, you they said you can have 10,000 people in, in, into a one setup. So um, I would say that for students uh, and, and, and in terms of presentation, it's here in the US, you know, there's a lot um, a few semesters ago, finished a whole online course at Harvard. And it's now become a very easy way to do it. In, in terms of uh, AAK, I remember doing the build talk at the University of Nairobi. And, and one thing to do, webinar architects to do weekly presentations so that the students are continuously still getting, you know, what, what, what the latest is, what's happening, and then, you know, from experience. So nothing is stopped. So their education is still continuing. I think you know that that part is uh, is is very important. I think there was another question that I uh, you had wanted to be answered as well. I think you answered actually. You talked about the next generation and that eventually it will end. And so, oh, what is yes. the normal? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, if I can just uh, probably this is uh, on this piece. Uh, my office right now. My work is international. I want to bring to the, the sobering uh, situation and, and the reality of the situation. We don't have any work right now. We are jobless. I just applied for unemployment. This is the reality. There are going to be financial stresses and it's going to be across the board. But there is definitely light at the end of the term. And one thing I learned when I was in Nairobi growing up, Teso Bila Chuki. There was actually a nightclub that used to have sukus and dombolo. Con Teso Bila Chuki, suffering without bitterness. Mm. If we can just, and you know, Kenyans are very good at this stuff. We have been through hardships. This is just yet another one, and it's going to go away. The profession is going to come out stronger, whether it's architecture, or landscape or engine, it's going to come out much bigger. Now, I, yes, the question that I wanted to answer was related to the gentleman who has got a PV gutter business and he can't go to the site. Now, having worked internationally and still doing, where we have been able to manage and supervise projects under construction. So what you do, again, create a routine. Get your clerk of works or your contractor to send you regularly photographs, and now, of course, we have video of the work that is being done. At the end of the day, beginning of the day, they send you all of this, and you make sure that you have a Zoom meeting with the contractor. And if the contractor has got access, the Wi-Fi access on the site, they can actually lead you through what's happening. And before that, they've already given you photographs. I think that's right now the best way to get some kind of supervision going. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I think, is there anyone from the audience who wants to actually ask a question? Please raise your hand and then you can unmute. Ooh, I can see a hand raised. Please unmute and, and ask your question. I just want to clarify one thing. There's a challenge with attendees asking questions, but uh, one of our fellows, we've added him to the panelists just to ask a quick question. It looks like attendees can only chat to ask questions instead of voice. Um, so let's give a moment to Architect F.G. Mungai, who's now. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you very much. Let me first of all uh, thank uh, the panelists for organizing such an, such an exciting uh, <clears throat> seminar and also making it possible for us to participate while you're at home. Uh, mine is more of a comment. 
Thank, thank Etta for, uh, for acknowledging my presence. Uh, mine, mine is a comment. Um, when, when we got this experience of having to work at home, <clears throat> the first thing we did as architects was to figure out, first of all, because we value our, our employees a lot, we quickly uh, figured out what we needed to do in terms of not exposing our employees in the event there is a, a serious outbreak of, of this uh, outbreak, uh, um, this disease. And uh, what we did is to agree that we are going to have at least one person uh, attending uh, physical work per week and the rest of the week be working at home and uh, to see how it's going to work. And what I've seen is that it has opened an opportunity, an opportunity that we never knew existed. That is, uh, while it looks very, very difficult to work at home, the fact that we have challenged ourselves into working into this, we are finding ourselves easily, easily uh, being able to continuously work. And the question that was asked about what do you do about monitoring, monitoring uh, the work. And what we have done is we have weekly targets. And mm -hmm. every Monday we have a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, every person has to report on what they achieve on that. And the reason why we got uh, these working is, is because I'm currently working on a project that is actually owned by a team of Kenyan diaspora in the US, and they come from different states. And uh, even the leadership is from different states, and the project is in Kenya. And we find that we are able to conduct even effective site meetings complete with drones where we are taking the client around the, the, the site and they see what is happening. So I think for me, it's an, it's an opportunity that was brought up by, uh, by, a, by the, this, this pandemic. I also happen to be a director of a bank. And again, when uh, this came in, the first thing we did was to do a simulation. A simulation where we are having 50% of the staff working remotely to see how it's going to, we started off with 75, and then we went to 50%, and then we went to 30%. And what I found is that, that uh, it's because you have never had a challenge uh, where, which was brought about by this. So while we know it's a problem that we're experiencing what you're experiencing right now, I believe it's an opportunity we as architects should try and, uh, and embrace and see how we can work best on it. Thank you, that was my comments. All right, thank you so much for those comments. Um, architect F.D. Mungai, we really appreciate your presence here. Um, some of the questions that we're seeing in the Q&A box, some of them will be answered, but actually some of them might actually be sent to, to all the attendees via email. So please keep asking and we'll see how to get the answers to you. So even as we begin to wind up, I think I'll ask each of the panelists just to have their closing out remarks. Um, and to mention just one takeaway from this season so that we can shape our future after the pandemic. We can start with you, Lil or Hitesh. Yeah, I, I, you know, right at the beginning, uh, it was very good to see that uh, a lot of people replied that they were inspired. The word, the inspired part was uh, the highest percentage. And that that's a great thing to be is to be now is to be hopeful, to be inspired, uh, to keep outlook uh, as much as you can. There's going to be financial stresses uh, that in your way, but be hopeful. Uh, this is going to end like everything else is, and uh, sooner rather than later, uh, we will be we will be back to uh, where we were. But hopefully, with a little bit be better reflection. Uh, a better vision. Great, thank you, Hitesh. Lilian? I think my biggest aha moment during this is when Christian said that, well, why, why is it that we're not essential to the crisis? And so mm -hmm. I, think, I think to take that, that point back to our places of work and to really position ourselves in a way that when the next thing rolls around, that's not how we're categorized, I think is incredibly um, insightful and important. So yeah. thank you for that. 
Thanks, Lillian, and thanks for, for being here. Robin? Um, yes, I, I, mean, I just wanted to um, let everyone know here that the, um, the state of housing and urban development has pulled together a diverse group of people across the sector who are relating to us as essential, if you will, and looking at what's our role in COVID um, responding currently and post-COVID. So um, a lot of the inter work and make it a safe environment for our employees. There should be guidelines from NCA that are, that are out and available for that. But we are looking at how do we economically recover experience and response very much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for that. I think my, my biggest takeaway, um, you know, is that is that the, the nature of our, our work was already under the pressure to change. And this might be that trigger that makes us do it um, quicker, um, sooner, and, and, you know, better or efficiently or effective, effectively. So I think um, the, the, the reality is basically all the challenges we can come up that are in our way of being effective in this particular time, starting from our own work being non-essential for these times like these to the day-to-day -day challenges of being able to do whatever we're doing right now are all questions that I believe is in our mandate to help our communities answer as architects and people in the built environment. We're tasked to build these built environments we call homes that we're asking people to work from. We're also tasked to develop commercial space and estate that um, you know, our offices occupy and you know, advise our clients on how to make best these decisions and so the investments are justified. And there's plenty of lessons we are learning right now that um, are going to make us make those recommendations better next time. Um, we, we are tasked to create uh, sustainable employment and, uh, for our employees, but also like for construction workers and you know, all of these sorts of things. For people in the material supply and manufacturing. Like we, we are in this interesting intersection where now the definition of our work can be can can return to that time where it cannot not be essential, if I can say that way. I don't know if that makes sense. And I think we need to seize that opportunity at the moment and come out with this out of this situation with an indication of what each of us has learned um, that allows us to embrace that new normal as, as Robin uh, called it. All right. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much for all the panelists here today. I can say that it's been a very informative session and a very inspirational one. Um, starting from Christian, who talked about being a, needing to be a voice of hope and starting to embrace this changing nature of work as something that is essential to our future and growth of an industry. Also looking at what Hitesh, Hitesh talks about, which is suffering without bitterness and using this opportunity to change the way we think about our industry. Um, Lillian also spoke about embracing a spirit of empathy during this season and being realistic about expectations about software, technology, access, etc. even as we begin looking at how to be productive in this time. And Robin talked about the magic in the mess, which is a great metaphor for exactly what is going on. We are all in this together and we need to sort of find a way to, to get out of it stronger and better. Um, as I said, I work for BuildX and we have completely changed our strategy, our operational strategy. We have embraced a lot of trust. So employers and employees have to trust the people that they're working for. 
and that they have um, right deliverables and expectations. We also, we still sketch with, like this, but we also embrace software like Slack, which allows people to collaborate and sketch on each other's work as they're speaking and to communicate effectively. Um, and Google Sketchboard as well. So technology as well as analog can be able to come together during this season. Um, it's been a pleasure being your moderator here today. And I want to hand over to Wilson, who will close out with a few closing remarks. Um, Wilson Mugambi is, a, is the Vice President of Architectural Association of Kenya, um, and he will be giving some few closing remarks as we close out. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, uh, On behalf of the AAK, I would like to extend uh, our heartfelt uh, um, appreciation to the panelists today. It's been a very involving and uh, very informative session. Uh, uh, Hitesh, Robin, Lillian, and Christian, thank you very, very much. We appreciate your time. But uh, at the same time, we are uh, looking on the positive of this uh, working from home sort of environment and your insights have been very helpful. I think uh, most practitioners are new to this, as uh, you have noted, and somehow we are getting a way to work in uh, and our, our industry is one which involves a lot of uh, uh, on and on sort of movement and consistent uh, interaction. And this platform of working from home and uh, being online is a very good uh, example as given by Hitesh and uh, uh, the rest of the panelists. Uh, um, I would like to draw your attention to, to all our members that uh, next week we'll have uh, another webinar because now we have a series of webinars every week. So next week's webinar will be on Beam and there'll be, it will actually be a Beam training session and uh, there'll be more information about that. Uh, as we close, I'd like to appreciate uh, all the members who've attended, uh, in particular our senior members, Ed Kimungai, Kiyoskari uh, Obashia, all of whom are fellows of AK, as well as one of our panelists, Hitesh Mehta. Uh, I would also like to appreciate uh, the panelists for taking the time to be with us and giving us the insights of uh, the other day. I'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone for tuning in. And let's meet again next week uh, at the same time. Uh, the flyers will be online and we look forward to seeing all of you there. And once again, thank you everyone, and particularly Eta, thank you for a marvelous job. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. I think I forgot something. There's something about the uh, Mentimeter uh, 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 survey that was being done by Mugure. Mugure, can you put it up on the screen for those who are still there to view? As you can see, that was uh, our survey was uh, asking members what was the major challenge working from home, and the results are as follows. So a myriad of reactions from people, from kids interrupting people having focus, comfort, uh, internet. So I think at the end of it, we have seen a bigger picture here. Thank you very much, Fugore. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again. Good night. Bye.